stretching across the continents to provide you positive, relevant, and balanced information with fresh insight from those in the know, right in the land, focusing a biblical lens on Israel and the Middle East. You're watching Focal Point. Welcome to another informative and educational edition of Focal Point, where our point of focus is to help you to better understand the issues affecting Israel and the Middle East today. We're so happy you're able to be with us here again. What do you think, Kevin? I think we have some very important information to share with our viewers today, Stacy, and they're not going to want to miss a single story. What do we have coming up in the next 30 minutes? Well, in a little while, we'll speak with a very special lady who has spent a major part of her career in the medical field in Israel, working hand in hand with a truly diverse set of people and circumstances. And after that, Focal Point's Dan Tracy has a heart-to-heart -heart conversation concerning reconciliation and prayer for the nation of Israel. And we'll also discuss the issue of life and how it affects the multitudes of women in Israel every year and how they're dealing with the unexpected. You won't want to miss this extremely moving interview. First, however, we're going to hear from our UK correspondent, Sam Hales, regarding his most recent trip to Southampton, where he sat down with an Anglican vicar who shares his views on how some media outlets can mislead, even those in the church, about issues concerning Israel. That's right. I'm here outside St. Mary's Church here in Southampton. I'm about to go inside and meet the Reverend Dr. Julian Davies. And Julian has just returned from Israel and he has much to say about the Holy Land, anti-Semitism and the Church of England. It seems that the, the present day Anglican Church is somewhat out of tune with what the traditional Anglican view of Israel has been. Um, certainly before the foundation of the State of Israel, many Anglicans uh, would have shared what was a common belief with most Christians about the return of the Jews uh, to their ancient homeland and also the idea that there would be a flowering of Jewish identity and culture in, in the last days. And uh, if you read the poetry of great Anglicans like Herbert, Vaughan and others, you will see this concept very clearly delineated. In this age though, after the foundation of the State of Israel, it seems that the Anglican Church has increasingly adopted um, a rather anti-stance anti towards the State of Israel and Jewish identity. It's very clear from what Paul is saying that the Church must not become arrogant. Uh, the church has a perspective within God's greater designs. In fact, uh, St. Paul says the promises of God are irrevocable. And uh, I take uh, among those promises the fact that uh, the promised land um, belongs in the first place to the Jewish people. And that the church is actually grafted and can only be understood in relationship to its, its Jewish past and, dare I say, its Jewish present as well. And so I'm led to believe that the hand of God is actually working um, within the church but also outside the church and that's what scripture confirms anyway, where we see the movement of nations um, is actually governed by God's purposes. But I look at it more from a wider historical perspective, knowing the propensity of the church um, and indeed many peoples to actually be anti-Semitic. Uh, there's no doubt about it that the Christian church has been anti-Semitic uh, throughout its history. And I don't root that in the pages of uh, the New Testament. It's not because of anything which the Gospel writers have written, although sometimes John is castigated for his statements. I think it's very important uh, for all who are within the Christian Church uh, not to have double standards and inconsistencies in the way in which they relate to Scripture. Um, 
I think we also need to root out any kind of anti-Semitism because um, I think there is a lot of anti-Semitism that's masquerading behind uh, uh, anti-Jewish feelings at present. A lot of it is very irrational and when you actually go to Israel and indeed when you go into the occupied territories as well you find that the situation is very different from what is being portrayed in the media but I think it is incumbent upon uh, all Christians who love truth that we have to expose uh, what are fallacies and inaccuracies and um, the untruths that are peddled not least by the media. After this break, we'll hear firsthand about what it's like to be a nurse in Israel while dealing with a diverse culture in the midst of sometimes urgent medical situations. And later, we'll meet a woman who's devoted her life to fighting for the future of life in the womb. Before that, however, we'd like for you to see the heart-to-heart -heart efforts of Christian Friends of Israel Jerusalem. For more than 25 years, they have touched the lives of more than a quarter of a million of those in need. Greetings from Jerusalem. I'm Ray Sanders, Executive Director and Co-Founder, along with my wife Sharon, Christian Friends of Israel Jerusalem. The question we want to ask ourselves is why should Christians be involved in praying for Israel and the Jewish people? We're the ones that God has called us to be watching on the walls of Jerusalem. This is a very important assignment that God has given to us as Christians that we must fulfill to do our best to be those guardians of Israel at this time in their history. We're excited to see what's happening between Christians and Jews in the land of Israel today. Judging from history, we can see that the relationships between Christians and Jews have been anything but acceptable to God. But we've seen over the years things beginning to change. And so we are here to undo damage that's been done in the name of Christendom, in the name of our Lord Yeshua. And we do this through many outreaches to the Ethiopian Jews in the land who are coming home to Israel, to Russian immigrants and, and immigrants from oppressed countries from all over the world. We have a unique distribution center where over a quarter of a million Jewish people have been helped by the kindness and by the love of Christian friends in the nations from all over the world. And we also help the poor and the needy, the people off the street, single mothers, broken homes, we help people who have been through terror attacks and trauma. We help the believers, uh, congregations, churches, uh, and, and people in the land who love the Lord. There are many outreaches of Christian Friends of Israel. We're plowing the ground, turning it over, and hopefully making a difference in this land. Now one of the things that we liken ourselves to is a perfect portrait of Ruth and Naomi. The story of Ruth, as you remember in the Bible, is that Ruth had a sister-in-law named Orpah. And Ruth clung to Naomi, who symbolizes Israel. Orpah gave Naomi a kiss and walked off into the dustbins of history. We've never heard from her again. That's sort of like a lot of the church. They give, gave Israel a kiss to say, thank you for what you've done for us, and then walked off. But Ruth clung to Naomi. And when she clung to Naomi, she said, don't make me leave you, please. Your land will be my land, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. And so she came alongside of Naomi and stayed with her and was Naomi's support. And that's what we are. We're a support to Israel. We stand for truth. The, the battle for Israel is for truth. And so there's many aspects to, to Christian Friends of Israel, and we invite you to hear more about us. Shalom. To partner with the Ministry of Christian Friends of Israel through prayer, volunteering, or financial gifts, please visit cfijerusalem.org. Welcome back bringing together the diversities of culture, race, and religious understanding can sometimes be a difficult endeavor. For a positive look at this type of challenge, we recently sat down with Maggie Evans, who has spent her nursing career in Jerusalem. We had a member of the, um, the American administration came to our hospital years ago and was surprised to find 
Jewish people in the same rooms as Arab people? And we said, yes, of course, because they had this idea in their mind that the, the Arabs and the Jews had nothing to do with each other. They were always fighting because this is what they see on the television. They see riots, they see people fighting the Israeli soldiers and the Palestinians throwing stones. They don't see people living in peace day by day. I think that media programs, they're always looking for the, the bad news. Good news doesn't make news. Bad news makes news. And so there are a lot of good things happening. And I think if we can talk about the good things that are happening and the successful things that are happening, that's also part of the news. In all the hospitals, they all strive to be centers of excellence. They're all striving to do the best thing for the patient. And therefore, I might know that somebody else is not going to be of the same political opinion or religious opinion of myself. But these things take second place when we are treating the patients, when we are coming to the patient, um, suddenly maybe there's an admission. Everything is forgotten. You're just concentrating on the patient to make him well. You know, there's a very big misconception about Israel, that Israel is in some way an apartheid state. If you come and you walk around the streets here, if you go down Jaffa Road, if you go on the buses, if you go on the, the light rail, the train or the tram as we call it in England, you will see religious Jews, secular Jews, religious Arabs, Christian Arabs, Muslim Arabs, everybody is all together. I was in Israel during the time of both intifadas, so that's the Arab uprising. That was a very difficult time. We had a lot of bombings on the buses. And in particular, I remember that one bus had been traveling on an evening of the Shabbat, when people start to travel again, and people had been visiting the Western Wall, and this bus had been blown up. And amongst the people were neighbors, friends, there were a lot of children, and all these people got brought to the various hospitals around. And there, I was treating a father who had injuries, and he didn't know whether his kids were dead or alive. Eventually, we located that his youngest child was, was in the intensive care unit. The social worker went and uh, took a photograph of the child, and she brought it to me. And she said, how can I show this photograph? This is a terrible photograph. How can I show the, this photograph of this man's child to this man? What is he going to think? And I said to her, it's a beautiful photograph. His child is alive. Go show him the photograph, because until he sees that photograph, he will not believe that his child was alive. In the hospital, I worked with Jewish staff, Arab staff. I actually was a patient in my own hospital. I had um, a team of people looking after me who were Orthodox, Jews among them, uh, Arabs among them, secular Jews among them. They were all working together for my benefit. I don't feel the difference that this person is a Muslim or this person is Jewish. So even though I felt my calling was to come and to work in one of the Jewish hospitals here, I believe that I should be caring for Jews, for Arabs, to show the love of Christ to anybody who are meeting day by day. We now turn our focus to not only prayer, but reconciliation, as our German correspondent, Dan Tracy, enlightens us on this wonderful new awakening taking place all around Europe today. Well, so Kyle, welcome. Thank you very much for taking time for this interview. We're here with the group called Christian Forum for Israel, and you've been here since the very inception. That's right. So can you tell me a little bit about the vision behind it? Why did this even start? Well, you know, that was uh, at a time when the theme Israel was difficult in Germany, and uh, some people felt that it's a very important theme and that we should take care of it. We were four different people or four different ministries so far who said it would be a good idea to come together, to do things together, to be stronger, to really stand up for Israel. Have you found that it's actually worked? Have you been able to do things together that you would not have been able to do on your own, for example? Absolutely, yes. I mean, it has not been 
easy all the time, but we managed to do things together, uh, especially uh, in the year 2002. We had a big demonstration in our capital, Berlin, and that was shortly before election time, and we were standing up and telling the people that we stand behind Israel, and we will not be silent for Israel, and that we ask our government to also stand with Israel. Especially in, in front of this building, you know, the Reichstag, in which Mr. Hitler worked as well, and uh, when we were meeting, the Israel flags were flying there instead of the, the, the swastika. The Lord says, for science sake, I will not be silent. And this is uh, the message to us Christians that we need to stand with Israel now when it's really not going well with them. God will keep his promise to Israel, so we better stand on his side. Now let me ask you, do you feel that the message is getting across? It's not so easy because, you know, this anti-Semitism is growing again, also in Europe and even in Germany. And uh, we really have to stand together. We have to be united, one in mind, and to reach the people to get the message ag across. You know, a bridge has two sides and you have to cross over. And actually what we try to do is to work for reconciliation between Israel and Germany and Christians and Jews. And we try to take as many German people, mostly Christians, uh, to take them to Israel, to meet the people there, to see with their own eyes, to hear with their own ears what is really going on there and not what uh, the media are telling us. Does that change people? When yes, you take absolutely. Them? I can tell you these tours to Israel, which are all prayer tours, and uh, it's very important that we really meet the people who live now there and who, who have the promises of God for today. It's a life-changing experience. Let me ask you one last question. What are your hopes for uh, the future of this Christian forum for Israel. Do you think it's really going to make a difference in Germany? I believe that with all my heart, but uh, there is one point to it. It depends on how much we are connected with God Almighty ourselves. I really believe that if we are walking truly in His Word, we have power. We have His power to change our society so that we can influence society instead of the society influencing us. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem should be a part of every Christian's daily prayer life. It certainly should be, Kevin. And as we take another look at the ministry of Christian Friends of Israel in Jerusalem, would you take a moment to prayerfully consider what the Lord might have you do as you partner with Him concerning Israel? We'll be right back. Shalom, I'm Sharon Sanders, uh, Director of Ministry of Teaching and co-founder of Christian Friends of Israel. Christian Friends of Israel is an evangelical ministry, non-denominational and international. We've been in Israel since December of 1985, laying the groundwork for an international ministry that is now around the world with representatives in over 30 countries. We have two specific arms, and that is blessing the Jewish people according to God's word, and number two, blessing the church by teaching her about her Hebraic roots according to the Bible, the word of God. Unfortunately, the history between Christians and Jews have not been that good over the centuries. Uh, the history books show that, and we're trying to undo some damage that was done on behalf of Christendom to Israel and the Jewish people. We do that through all of our outreaches. We're people-to-people -people program. We may be helping terror victims in Starot. We may be helping communities under attack in the north. We may be helping uh, Ethiopian Jews who've come from uh, Ethiopia as immigrants or Russian Jews who've come from the former Soviet Union to make their home in Israel. We also help the poor and the needy and also victims of the Holocaust who are still alive and the last living witnesses to the, uh, to the Shoah, 
to the, um, the Holocaust that happened in Europe some years ago. We want to be the comforters that God called us to be, the blessers of Israel. We don't want to curse Israel. We want to be among the blessers. That way we can flow in the blessings of Abraham as we bless her. She gave us Jesus, the prophets, the apostles. Uh, the, uh, she gave us the, new, the early church. All that we have, Israel gave us. And it was to Israel that the Messiah, Yeshua, came to. He went up to heaven from Jerusalem and he'll return to Jerusalem. This is a city destined to become the throne of the Lord. Anyone who touches her, touches the apple of God's eye, join us today. Help us, come alongside, pray for the ministry, pray for the people who are working in the land, intercede for Israel, carry her on the wings of prayer, and we will be your suppliers to supply you with the information. We will give you the teachings, we will give you the conferences, we will give you that which you need to be those witnesses to others in the church to learn much more about Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you for listening. And we pray that you'll become our partner. Shalom. To partner with the Ministry of Christian Friends of Israel through prayer, volunteering, or financial gifts, please visit cfijerusalem.org. As we bring this edition of Focal Point to a close, we would like to introduce you to a wonderful woman after God's own heart. Sandy Shoshani recently spoke with us about her efforts to preserve life within the land of Israel as she strives to bring healing and help to mothers who often feel lost and alone. The leading cause of abortion today, I would say, is poverty. The leading cause. I mean, if you were talking in a general way, you would say the leading cause is fear on their forehead, fear. I am so afraid that I'm not gonna manage with this child. I'm so afraid that I haven't got the finances to manage with this child. I don't think that the world realizes how much poverty there is in Israel. Out of our population, of the nearly eight million at this point, where our population has grown, we have 1,800,000 persons under the poverty level. 800,000, and out of those people, we have 800,000 children living under the poverty level. That is a lot of people that are poor. So even this morning, I had a phone call from a woman. She said there's a couple who just got married a year ago. Um, both were divorced, both have their children, and they're not making ends meet. They can barely pay their rent, and she's pregnant. They want to abort. Both of them want to abort. What are you going to do? Will you phone them? And I said, no question. I want to help them. I want to help them. Finance should never be a reason to have an abortion, nor should fear, because our fears are only of the things that are unknown. Once the baby comes, a person is able to cope. In 2006, we began a program called Operation Moses. Operation Moses provides for every mother and her baby for one full year all of the baby's needs. About two weeks from birth, we provide her with the new from a store, from a local chain store, which has branches all over the country, we provide her with the bed, the stroller, and the bathtub, and beautiful sheets and, and guardrails for the baby in the bed. And then we, every month, we give her the baby diapers and formula, or the card to buy these items. We want to be able to give the woman pretty much everything she needs for a full year, for, until the baby's first birthday, so that finance is not the reason to abort the baby. You can see quickly in the Bible, in Psalm 139, that God has created our inner parts. God has molded us in the womb. God knows our days ordained before there's even yet one of them. And even more obvious is that God said to Jeremiah, before you were, I called you to be a prophet. What about Rebecca, who was pregnant, and she felt all this mess in her stomach, and she said to God, why is it like this? And God said, you have two nations in your womb. There was a calling on the child's life before they were even born. Jesus and John and so many, Isaiah, many had a calling on their lives. It's quoted in the Bible before they were even born. 
So we can see that God has determined life of a child before they're born. We say something quite interesting. We say, when you're pregnant, you're already a mother because you're carrying a child. And they often come into me and they say, I don't want to have a baby. And I said, but sweetheart, you do have a baby. You're already pregnant. You're already a mother. The question is, what are you going to do with your child? Not if you're pregnant. Anybody would not want to be pregnant in particular situations. But what are you going to do? And so after an abortion, when a woman has had, made that choice, she's going to suffer always. Women feel bad about themselves. They feel bad that they couldn't keep the baby. They feel bad that they made that choice and they're hurting. You know, some women hurting will say, God will never forgive me and turn away from God. And as I said, become hard. Some women and many of my friends after abortion have come to faith. We have, practically speaking, we have courses, Bible studies, group studies, seminars for women who've had abortions. And we have something really fabulous we have something called the Ganei Chaim, the Life Gardens. This is a place in Latrun where women or men, and many men have come also, who have had an abortion or a miscarriage, can come and plant a tree in memory of the unborn child. And I've seen much healing from this, much healing. Because if you've had an abortion, you have not been allowed to grieve. You've never been allowed. You did it. People say, you did it, you did it. Why would you grieve? Why would you grieve over something you did? But you do grieve, and you long for the child. And so coming to the garden and planting a tree as a memorial, and typically the women name the baby, it allows you finally to have closure. I like the old quote, a baby is God's opinion that life should go on. I believe that we all need to keep Sandy and the women she ministers to as a point of prayer. Don't you agree, Kevin? I certainly do. And I'd also encourage our viewers to continue praying for those volunteering in the land of Israel and not to forget to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. As always, we encourage you to email us with your thoughts and topic ideas for future shows at info at focalpointtv.com. Remember when you write to let us know where you're currently viewing Focal Point. You can always reach us by calling the number on your screen. If we miss your call, please feel free to leave a message and someone will return your call. We look forward to being with you next time as we turn our point of focus to Israel and the Middle East. Right here on Focal Point. Thanks for watching and goodbye for now. Goodbye. Focal Point is brought to you by Christian Friends of Israel Jerusalem. For more information about any of today's guests, email us at info at focalpointtv.com. To partner with the Ministry of Christian Friends of Israel through prayer, volunteering, or financial gifts, please visit cfijerusalem.org. Production of Level E Media Incorporated.